Welcome to the March 20, 2009 edition of the Open Forum. Once again, we have that grand opportunity of looking together into the Word of God. Oh, my. I, I always uh, have to pause a moment and, and think in my mind, uh, thanks to the Lord, that we have this kind of an opportunity because there's nothing more important than that we more know more and more from the Word of God. And as we talk about a verse together, uh, we are learning. We are learning uh, because we, we find that, that it, the Bible is very difficult to understand, and we have to be very patient with each other as we learn from thy Word. But this is your program. We want to hear from you. So shall we take our first call tonight, please? Welcome to Open Forum. <clears throat> Welcome to Open Forum. The number to call, incidentally, again, is 1-800-322-5385. 1-800-322-5385. And shall we take our first call this evening, please? Hello? Yes, good evening. Good evening to camping. I mean, brother camping. Question for you. In Philippians 2, I mean, Philippians 2, like 6 and 7, it says, Christ is in the image of God, and then he emptied himself. What does it mean he emptied himself? Well, you see, this is a, a very, very good question and a very important question. We read in Philippians chapter 2 who about the Lord Jesus Christ, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And in being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, you see... Christ is eternal God. He never ceased to be eternal God. The Bible clearly teaches that He is the creator of the world. The Bible clearly teaches that in Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Bible teaches that Thy throne, speaking of the Lord Jesus, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Yet, in order to make payment for our sins, he had to become like one of us. He had to become man. He had to become identified as the Son of Man. Uh, and he had to, had to uh, be laden with our sins, the sins of those that he had come to save. And he did all of this long before he ever created the world. And, and he, in other words, he had to empty himself of his glory. He is now, now uh, someone under the wrath of God because he is laden with our sin. How terrible, terrible that Almighty God had to come to that point and, and uh, then come under the judgment of God which the law of God demands, namely, the wages of sin is death. And so he had to die in a shameful death. And, uh, and only because he rose again uh, could he continue to be eternal God. And that's what it means here, that he emptied himself of his glory. When he came, for example, to demonstrate, to demonstrate how he suffered for our sins. He didn't come to this earth in a blaze of glory uh, as King of kings and Lord of lords. He came looking like one of us. He became one of us in every way, except he was without any sin in himself. And then he had to endure again the wrath of God uh, to demonstrate to us how he suffered. He became again a suffering servant. Oh, 
uh, so that he is hanging on the cross. That's eternal God hanging on the cross. That's his, his, uh, uh, his, uh, the highest, highest king of glory hanging on the cross. But what do we look at that? What do we see there? We see a criminal who is being executed with as great a shame as possible uh, because he, uh, because he is demonstrating how he had to die for our sins. And that's what it means. He emptied himself of his glory. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, hello. Yes, go ahead. Yes, my question is, I was wondering, does God only forgive his elect? Does God he came to, only to, forgive his elect? That's a fair question. You see, the problem is that God cannot just promiscuously uh, forgive somebody for their sin and because the law of God, which God is under, he is under the same law that we are under, namely the law that we find in the Bible. And the, the law says the wages of sin is death. That means that wherever there is sin, the payment of death has to be made. Now, he can't forgive someone unless that payment is made by someone. If, say, if that person could die and then rise again, then he would be for forgiven. But when he dies, he's dead. He'll never come to life again, never come to conscious existence again. And uh, so uh, he, he uh, 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 therefore, uh, therefore, the only way that he can forgive any of us if he has made payment for our sin, and the only ones he has made payment for our sin is are, are, are those who he has elected to salvation. Not only has he elected them, but he's also made the payment for their sins so that at some time in their lifetime, chosen, chosen by God, either as a little baby or as a, an adult or as a, an old person or an hour before death, uh, whenever he can for, forgive that person, because he has made already made payment for the sins of that person. Is there any exception to the rules? There cannot be an exception because the law of God won't allow it. The, the law of God does not permit that. The law of God stipulates the wages of sin is death, and there is no exception to that. And since um, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, Go you ahead. were saying something. I interrupted you. I'm sorry. The, the fact. Uh, it's, uh, uh, so I'm going to have to uh, uh, say thank you for calling. And shall we go to our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Amos chapter one, verse one and two. Yes two years before the earthquake. Well, you said the other night that you did not understand this, but this is two months away now, and with your declarations, this is very serious. Well, except that we don't tell the Bible what it's supposed to say. We're not we, telling the Bible. Well, we certainly are. We are. It's your, you're right that we're two months away from two years, but uh, we have no way at least not so far that I can tell that we can identify what's going to happen or if that if this verse relates to that I don't know I don't know I we can we can <laughs> we can make all kinds of of uh, suggestions and and speculations but that is worth nothing it has to come from the bible and I don't know, I have not found anything in the Bible that relates to a literal two years before the, uh, the uh, uh, time when the earthquake will come. I 
Uh, it's, this is simply the words of Amos, though, that God came uh, to Amos with two years before the earthquake, and we, and we have... Uh, God has not defined so far that I can find anywhere what he means by that. And so we cannot try to force this and say, I'm going to find out what this means. We, we, we have to le learn to wait upon the Lord. Now, maybe in the next two months we'll learn something more. But so far, not. So I'm sorry. It was Revelation 9 that you're constantly talking about? Revelation 9. The earthquake? It, yes. It is the same earthquake. That, I believe, well, I don't know. I didn't say here what earthquake this is. It's saying two years before the earthquake. Well, what earthquake? In the days of, of uh, Uzziah. And uh, how does that earthquake get? There are lots of earthquakes recorded, uh, spoken of in the Bible. Many earthquakes. It's not saying that this is the earthquake that's going to happen on the first day of judgment. We don't, I don't, in other words, we, 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 <laughs> we, can't, we can't have our way about this and force some kind of an answer. Uh, we have to learn to wait upon the Lord. But thank you for calling and sharing. And share, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, could you read uh, Genesis? One twenty-nine, thirty, and thirty-one. Genesis, which chapter? One, verse twenty-nine. Thirty and thirty-one. Yes, let's look at that. Genesis chapter one, verse twenty-nine and thirty and thirty-one. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb a bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth. And every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat or for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to every living thing that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now, what is your question? Can we go also to Revelation chapter 22, verse 1 and 2? Revelation 22, verse 22. There we read... Excuse me, verse 1 and 2. Uh, verse 1 and 2. We read, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, Proceeding out of the throne of God and the Lamb, in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. Now, what is your question? Okay, my question is about medical marijuana. Everybody says it's bad, but actually, you know, the medication that they take, you take a handful of that, you're actually, that's poison that will kill you for marijuana. Medical marijuana won't do that. I am have threat, and this has reduced all of my medication from ten medications. Well, excuse me, excuse me. God has. We we're not going to get into a political argument here at all. But the fact is that God has created this earth, and He created everything perfect. All there was no. Uh, poisonous plants, there were no poisonous animals, there were no thorns and thistles, there would not have been marijuana uh, when God first created the earth, at least marijuana the way it is now. But when mankind rebelled, then God put a curse upon this earth. And so the ground began to give forth thorns and thistles, and poisonous snakes appeared, and poisonous plants appeared. And, uh, and uh, so on, this earthquakes and volcanoes. This is because the earth came under the curse of God. And so we don't have to think for a moment because God created everything good at the beginning that that means every plant is good today. Now, marijuana, uh, that is, uh, we have to leave that to the authorities. The authorities, uh, as they look at it, they see that it can be very damaging to a person's mind, and many people 
We have many people today who have started out with marijuana and they've gone on to stronger drugs and they have taken alcohol with it and now their minds are fractured. That's that's a known commodity. That's There's no uh, uh, question about that. And so uh, if they're able to uh, take a poisonous plant and, uh, and uh, uh, br break it down into what it's made of and and find something in it that might be helpful uh, for medical purposes, that may be possible. But uh, please, we can't use the Bible as a proof of any kind of a proof that we should be allowed to use marijuana for medical purposes. Well, we got millions of patients that says all oh, are different. It doesn't make you go mad or crazy or it's poisonous. And we also have doctors that says also differently. Well, excuse me. Now, you have no way of proving that there are millions of patients. That's simply, okay. a, that's simply a statement. The fact is that no one has ever counted the number of patients that have been helped by marijuana. And so, but anyway, we're in a, the wrong kind of a venue uh, for this kind of a discussion. Uh, marijuana has nothing, the, the Bible has nothing to say about what, whether marijuana is to be used for medical purposes or not. And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Campaign. How are you feeling today? Uh, I have I, I thank you very much. <laughs> I'm very well, thank you, by God's mercy. Yeah, that's, that's good to hear. Um, I called you last night. Uh, it's kind of like a touch-up on what we was talking about last night. Um, I was saying that uh, sometimes I feel like, you know, I'm not worthy to even proclaim the Word of God because it's like whenever I fall into sin, it's like it, I feel like um, I have to wait a certain amount of time. Sometimes I feel like that, a certain period to what I'm doing good, but I realize that, well, obvious. Excuse me. I understand perfectly because if we're still uh, have sin in our life, if we're not getting victory over it, and then we're going to talk to somebody else about their sinners and they right. they need the help of God, we feel like a hypocrite. Right. Physician, heal yourself. And uh, and in fact, sometimes I get the question, and now I can see a, a, a plausible answer to that. People will ask, well, if I'm not saved, should I be sharing the gospel? Well, one of the reasons, one of the problems with that is you are really uh, uh, being a hypocrite. What about yourself? Are you really praying, praying, praying for God's mercy? And have you really become broken? Or are you somehow using the idea of sharing the gospel as kind of a proof that, I, but I still am kind of good. I'm still kind of good. Uh, the fact is that when we read Isaiah 6, where Isaiah became qualified to bring the gospel, he first became a child of God. And that that at least can give us some direction on that question. I don't, I don't, um, I don't feel like, you know, like maybe uh, I could do a little good, because e even in the middle of conversations that I have, like, because with my fiancé, I feel like, you know, Upon, like, well, I really don't want to talk about nobody else's sin or nothing like that. But, you know, well, the, somebody that, this is somebody that I want to marry, you know. Wait, so, let, let, uh, and, but but uh, good has to come from God. And and the, the first place to begin with is a broken and a contrite heart I will not despise. And we want to start with the fact of, of praying for for humility, praying that we might become humble and that we might not have pride. And uh, and pride is a very insidious thing. It's something that sneaks into our life just at the moment we think we're very, very humble. It may be that in actuality that's a function of our pride. Uh, pride is, is, is a problem with every human being. And so you see, the place to start out with is like the public, and oh God, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. I am a sinner. I deserve hell and I, the wrath of God. Oh God, have mercy on me. Have mercy. Have mercy. And uh, and I can 
I can share the fact with others that, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really troubled. I'm praying to God for mercy. And, you know, any of us can do that. That's one way of sharing the gospel, even though you may not be a child of God yourself. But we have to be careful that we're not sharing it in a way so it looks like, well, I'm okay, but I wish that you too were okay. I have but, one more question, Mr. Campbell. Yes. All right. Um, it's about my, my family. Yeah, now, excuse me. You called last evening, did you not? No, I called last night. Yeah. Yes, and we only want to call once a month, and therefore, I'm sorry, we, we, that's not fair to all the other people who are trying to call in. Call once a month, and not more than that. So thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I would like to compare two scriptures. And those scriptures are Matthew 10:39, Matthew 10:39, and John 10:10. 10, 10. They both talk about life. One talking about losing life for Christ. The other uh, one talking let, about. Let's, let's first of all look at Matthew 10:39. that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. And then John 10, verse 10. Right. There we read in John 10, verse 10, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now, what is, you have two different verses. What is your question? Well, they appear to contradict one another. Uh, one talks about abundant life, and one talks about losing life for Christ. So uh, that's, I'm just wondering how to explain that. Well, the fact is that abundant life has to do with salvation. He that findeth his life, life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Now, there it's talking about the fact that what we consider to be uh, uh, to be uh, life uh, in uh, uh, being uh, in accord with what the world is doing, we lose that. We find that that's not where the action is. That's not what is important. That's not going to help us uh, uh, beyond this life at all. But we have to find the life that's in the Lord Jesus Christ, and then we the, this life becomes totally unimportant whether we have or have not this or that, uh, whether we are, uh, 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 whatever our situation, we can be in the poorest situation and yet have everything. Like the, uh, like the man Lazarus in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 15 or Luke 16. Now in John 10, verse 10, the, it says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now, you see, the life that Christ comes to give us is eternal life. That is the abundant life. That's not physical life. That is a life that is forevermore in e e e throughout eternity future. And, and that, uh, there's nothing in this world that can compare with that. But thank so you. Can I ask one more question? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, in response to that, in regard to Matthew 10:39, talking about losing your life for Christ, does that mean that we have to live an ascetic lifestyle then and go live our life up on top of a pillar out in the middle of the desert, or what? Well, no, not at all. It means what is our attitude toward life? We live in this world. We have to live in a house. We have to live in... A city, we have to have a job in order to have food on the table and so on. But what is important is the house we live in, the city we live in, the job we have. Is that what's important? Or is it important that we have a right relationship with God? That is where life is, in a right relationship 
with God and it has nothing to do about what our what our we can live in a castle or we can live in a in a king's uh, home but it, 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 it what is important is is what really is important to us is uh, do I have a right relationship with Christ and want to serve him altogether in other words am I being obedient to all the laws of the Bible but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum yeah good evening mr capping yes uh first john chapter 5 verse 16 first john chapter 5 verse 16 there we read if any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. Is that the, or the verse? Yes, it is. And you're wondering what is that sin unto death? Well, the um, last sentence, there is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. What is that? Well, the the fact is that uh, all sin in one sense is unto death the wages of sin is death but all sin can be forgiven if it's God's good pleasure to forgive that sin by making payment for it however there's one sin that God uh, indicates cannot be forgiven that's found in, in uh, the gospel of Matthew and the uh, gospel of Mark it had to do with the scribes that believed they had the sin of believing that Christ was under the power of Satan. And Christ said that uh, those who have that sin have uh, blasphemed the Holy Spirit and there is no forgiveness. Therefore, that is a sin unto death which cannot be forgiven. Now, it was a very, very uh, narrow for, for prescribed sin because I don't read of it anywhere else in the Bible and I've never met anybody who believed that Christ was under the power of Satan but thank you and we're going to pause for this message we're continuing with the open forum and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum hello Mr. Captain yes um, good, good evening how are you doing very um, well I got a question you. And um, how is this world is going to come to an end? And uh, I know it's on fire, but uh, what a nuclear holocaust! Oh no, by oh no means. You know, does God does God need any help for man uh, to have a huge earthquake or a great tsunami or a huge volcano? Does God need any help for man for any of those things? The answer is no, no. And God describes how he's going to bring it finally to an end. We read in Second Peter chapter 3, Second Peter chapter 3, he says in verse 10, The day of the Lord, that, that day of the Lord is judgment day, will come as a thief in the night. That is for all of those who are still in, in the... Uh, uh, spiritual nighttime, they have not become saved. Uh, it, they'll be caught by surprise altogether because they're not listening carefully to the Bible at all. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And then he says further, in verse 12, uh, the wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. In other words, God simply is going to destroy it uh, on that last day, which we know from the Bible calendar as being October 21, 2011. The whole universe will be annihilated by fire. It will be destroyed and never, never come to remembrance again. It'll be gone forever. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kempton. God bless. Thank you for calling and sharing. 
And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, let me kill on radio. Don't. Yes. Okay. Um, I I wanted to look at Genesis two. Genesis two, yes. Um, which verse? Verse two. Genesis two, verse two. We read, and on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made now what is your question now we compare that to uh exodus 31 exodus 31 uh verses 16 and 17 exodus 31 Verse 16 and 17, there we read. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual or an eternal covenant or eternal law. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days Jehovah made heaven and earth and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Now, what is your question? My question is, okay, you're you're saying that the, the Sabbath has changed to Sunday, and God put that man to death uh, for picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. How now, could he be just in changing, uh, changing but, it to Sunday and that's not be under the same penalty? You, you your, know, your, excuse me, your problem is... You are only reading a few verses concerning the Sabbath. You are not reading everything. The biblical rule is that we never, never arrive at a conclusion, no matter how clear the verse seems to be, until we have checked that, uh, that conclusion against anything and everything else the Bible teaches. Now, for example, in, Jeremiah, in Exodus 31... In verse 13, uh, it says, Speak all th thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I, Jehovah, that doth sanctify you. Now, what is that saying? We have to keep that in mind. It's true that Christ rested on the seventh day uh, because he is de demonstrating that that seventh day Sabbath was a day when there was not to be any work. But now we have a further explanation. That is a sign that, we, that God has done all the work to sanctify us, that is to make us his children. In other words, he has done all the work we are not to do any work. And in fact, he says, uh, he goes on in verse 14, Ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. Wow! What a terrible thing that is. If we work, uh, if we do any work, to try to get ourselves saved, like accepting Christ or getting water baptized or, or whatever, uh, make confession of faith or any work where we, where we can say, I assisted in getting myself saved, we are going to be put to death. We are not saved at all. And God demonstrates that uh, uh, again in Numbers 15. And so we have to read everything. Uh, 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 you know, in Deuteronomy 5, for example, God, in, in Exodus 20, God gives it as a reason for keeping the seventh-day Sabbath because God uh, created everything in six days and rested the seventh day. But look at what it says in Deuteronomy 5. It says in verse... Uh, in verse uh, 13 or verse 12, keep the Sabbath day uh, to sanctify it 
as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, in it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor any stranger that is within thy gates, with that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well. Now that, as, as well as thou. Now that's parallel to Exodus 20, where the Ten Commandments are given, and the, seventh, and the Fourth Commandment has to do with keeping the Sabbath day. But now notice, this, this goes on and says something quite different. And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath. Well, now, what does that mean? It means that he did all the work to rescue Israel from Egypt, which was a picture of what salvation is. He did all the work. And that agrees with Exodus 31 that it is a sign that I, the Lord, sanctify thee. And so uh, the reason, uh, therefore, it was a ceremonial law. It was a law that was pointing to an aspect, on a very serious and important aspect of what salvation is. But unfortunately, there are those who grabbed hold of that verse and... and, and uh, uh, they simply have made it to uh, to agree with what they wanted to hear about it. Uh, in fact, uh, those who go to the Adventist church, they are trusting in Ellen G. White, the visions that she had of a halo around the fourth commandment. And, and uh, she, she was not a spokesman from God because we're not to hear anything from God outside of the Bible. It, the, uh, indicating that that whole gospel is completely uh, wrong. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes. Hi, Mr. Campe. I hope you're doing well. And God bless you. Yes. I have a question. When does the Sabbath actually start? Is it Friday evening? It began uh, at sundown. Uh, the seventh day Sabbath began on sundown on fr uh, Friday and went till sundown on Saturday. Uh, when God uh, initiated the, uh, the, as it began to dawn toward the first of the Sabbath, that is the Sunday Sabbath, God does not stipulate, but we know at least that it goes, it, it, uh, it uh, goes until midnight on Sunday, and so it would probably begin on midnight on Saturday. But God doesn't get into that issue with any seriousness. But when you say with, with, without any seriousness, I mean, if we're following the Bible, then shouldn't we be following, uh, I mean, that law, as the Jewish faith does, they start their, their, as I understand, they start their... Well, no, well, but we have to read everything in the Bible. Now, for example, we read in the book of Acts where Paul preached in Troas till midnight, till midnight. Now, that was the midnight of the Sabbath day, of the Sunday Sabbath. And we know that Christ rose uh, 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 in Matthew 28. It says, as it began toward... It began to dawn toward the first of the Sabbath, and so that Sabbath began that morning. And uh, so uh, God doesn't necessarily have to have one Sabbath follow uh, right on the hour behind uh, the last one. But we know the Did seventh day Sabbath it that way. was He followed it by the Sabbath starting on the Friday evening and ending on the Saturday evening. That's my question. Did Jesus follow she, that law? Jesus, well, Jesus lived at a time when he had not instituted the Sunday Sabbath yet. That was not instituted till Christ arose from the grave. That's why Matthew 28 says, as it began on, at the end of the Sabbath, uh, as it began to dawn toward the Sabbath, 
In other words, this is the first Sabbath after Christ uh, it began uh, after Christ arose. And so, of course, when he was living, uh, he was following the the uh, ceremonial law of the Old Testament. He was circumcised. He, he uh, observed the Passover, and he observed the seventh-day Sabbath. That's not... A, that uh, he was he was just following all the laws as all the Jews were supposed to follow the laws of that time. I but see. thank you for calling in, Sherry. Sherry, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum, Mr. Camping. Yes, I've been listening to you for uh, about a month now. Um, I would like to tell your listeners that uh, they should go on to the Internet and put in your name. There's a lot of wonderful websites out there about you. And uh, I think they would learn a lot about what you have to say. And uh, maybe it would open their eyes a little bit. And I think you are very, very wrong, sir, in a lot of what you are saying. I, I, I don't quite understand your... Are, are there, do you have a question? In other words, are yeah, you making? Excuse me. Are you making a suggestion how we can get more listeners? Uh, <laughs> I am making a suggestion to people to not leave their churches, like you are saying. I think you are so wrong, sir. The Bible has nothing in it that states that they should leave their churches, and I think you are misleading them. I don't know why you believe this. I, I truly believe, sir, that you believe that you are correct in what you are telling people. Well, but the fact is, excuse me, the fact is, uh, you can do with the Internet whatever you want to do, but our job is to declare to the world in every best way we can what we find to be truth. And you may think I am deceiving. That's your privilege, of course. But you have to base that on the Bible. And you have to come up uh, and, and, and show from the Bible that, that I am deceiving. Uh, to get the book, for example. Uh, uh, we're, we're almost there. Or the book, To God Be the Glory. And look at that carefully. And then, and then uh, uh, find in the Bible, how something is stated there that is uh, misleading people because all we want to do is be faithful to the Word of God. And just because you don't think we're faithful, that doesn't mean we're not faithful. It just means that from your knowledge of the Bible at this point, it looks like we're not faithful. But uh, I may I encourage, I encourage you to keep studying and keep checking uh, to make sure you know what you're speaking of. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes. Uh, John, 5th chapter, 37. John 5, 37. There we read John 5, 37. We read, And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent him ye believe not. Now, what is your question? Well, do you believe people receive visions? Oh, well, the the... the uh, up until that time, God was still showing himself uh, in ways other than through the written word. He, uh, he was giving visions to people. There were people who heard uh, the voice from heaven, This is my beloved son, hear ye him. That was possible because the Bible was not yet completed. Now, now that the Bible is completed, which didn't occur until maybe... 30 or 30, or maybe 60 years after Christ went back to heaven, then that now it's impossible to 
uh, here uh, directly from God in a vision or a voice or a dream, but we have the whole Bible. We have the whole Bible. When this was being written in John 6, uh, John 5, they did not have the whole Bible yet. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, um... I, I hate to agree to disagree with you, sir, but I was just calling to say the way that you were talking about how the end of times are coming. Isn't it says clearly in the Bible that he's coming and we're supposed to wait? And even though you bring up a date, a certain date, aren't we supposed to be waiting even if you bring that date? Because the whole thing is, last time, I, it was a few months back when the kid called and saying he's not going to college. Because if God come in, it's a waste of time. And I kind of find that weird because a long time ago, they also said God was, was coming. And signs were very clear that God was coming to them. And he didn't come. Everything stopped. They stopped. And that also well, happened in the time of the epistles when they thought God was coming and they told the whole town and the whole town stopped. Well, excuse me. The fact is yeah, you are correct that... Uh, throughout history, uh, from time to time, there have been individuals who have said, I know when Christ is coming. And there, that date has passed every time, every time their prediction was wrong. But if we would study their predictions, how they arrived at them, we would find that it had very, very little content in it that had to do with the Bible. A lot of it was intuition or a lot of it was... Or whatever, a dream or a vision or whatever. But but finally, the Bible has something to say about this. And the Bible has a whole lot to say about this. Uh, the Bible indicates that right near the end, there would be a whole lot more information that would, we would know. And that includes the timeline of history as well as the nature of God's judgment plan. And this is what we now know today because God has opened our eyes to this additional information that's always been in the Bible, but has been impossible for anybody to understand. And now, if, if for those who are not spiritually discerned, and that is discerning, that is, they are still in the nighttime of, of sin, they, uh, they have not had their spiritual eyes open they're not in the light yes he's going to come as a thief in the night they are in the night time he will come and surprise them but on the other hand there are lots of there are people who are children of God whose spiritual eyes have been open and who can who are intensely interested in everything in the Bible is declaring and who are checking out all these uh, things they're hearing on family radio, for example, and they are, co are concluding, yes, indeed, indeed, we are right n near the end. We do know the time of Christ's coming. They have been watching, and they are qualified, therefore, also to warn the world, and that has to be that that warning goes out, that the thief is coming, that is, Christ is coming to destroy, and, and uh, he is... Uh, uh, he is uh, he is coming uh, also to complete his work of salvation. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Campion. Um, do you know how long um, Jacob was with Laban? It was more than 20 years, right? How Jacob uh, was with his, he was there 40 years, 40 years. 40 years? Yeah. Okay. And when he, and when he served uh, seven years and seven years, and then the six years for the spotted cattle. Yes, was, and then he was, also worked for labor for 20 years. For, was, for 20 years. Now, was that, did, did he, did he have all his children during, like, did he have Levi and... He had yeah. all of his children during those 40 years except uh, except uh, uh, Benjamin. Uh, Joseph was the last one, and Joseph was born just two or three years before the end of the 40 years. 
Okay, so some of them were with with the, with the twenty years with Laban, and then some was, were when he left, right? Yes, yeah, were the forty years? No, none were. No, the the all the children except well except Benjamin were born while he was still uh, uh, with Laban. Although the last few years were he was not very close to Laban, he was three days. Uh, three days away from Laban in another part of the land, tending his sheep. Okay, now, but the twenty years he was with La with Laban in, in Laban's house. It said, "Right in thy house, serve with me twenty years." But then, part of it he was a, he was three days journey away. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, and then all the children were born while he was in Laban's house for I 20 don't years? Know. I don't know. I don't know why, uh, about that. I don't know. I know he was 40 years away from uh, the land of Israel with, uh, uh, with uh, under the friendship of Laban, and, uh, and, uh, and during that time, all of his children except Benjamin were born. Now, that much I can say with certainty, but uh, to, to detail it further than that, it's been too long since I've, been, I've looked at that carefully. Okay, but I have another question. Um, um, now, when Joseph was in Egypt, that's a picture of the Great Tribulation. Um, and then, uh, could you look at Genesis 45, verse 19? It's almost like they were commanded to come out of Canaan. Well, like they were commanded they, uh, to come mean, out of the You churches. mean Jacob? You yes, verse? he was commanded to come out of, the, out of the land of Canaan. He was commanded to go to Egypt to be under the care of Joseph. Right, and then, in, in Gen and then in Genesis 45:20 it says that they weren't to get their stuff, kind of like it uh, reminds me in Luke 17:31 it says don't go back to get your stuff. Yeah, well, let, let me read Genesis 45:20. Uh, 45:20. There we read... And regard not your stuff, for the good of all, the land of Egypt is yours. And the children of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them wagons, and they, according to the commandment of Pharaoh, and gave them provision for the way, and so on. And so it was simply that they were going to Egypt, and, they're, and they were going to be there a long time. In fact, that family, as it grew into a nation, was there uh, for 430 years. This was not a, a temporary uh, arrangement to escape the famine, although that it began with that, but they actually were there 430 years. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hello? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I got a question for you. Yeah. Um, I heard you say that, um, you know, that, give me a second, let me put down my radio. I'm sorry? Yeah, hello? Hello? What is your question, please? Yeah, no, my question is that, um, Would you I turn you your, that excuse Christ me. Christ died on a Friday afternoon. Hello? Uh, yes, t turn, did you turn your radio off? Yeah, yeah, I that did. That will help us. Now, what is your question? All right, now my question is, um, you said that Christ died on a Friday afternoon and rose on a Sunday morning. Yeah. But um, Jesus has said that um, the way you can tell that he's the Messiah, because they asked him for a sign. He said a wicked generation will get no sign but Jonah being in the belly of the whale three days and three nights. So if Christ died on a Friday afternoon... And rose on a Sunday morning. That's not even. That's not even two days and two nights. Oh, excuse me. You have all. You have Friday. You have all day Friday. It'd be, in fact, his punishment, or as he's de, de showing us how he was punished, began on Thursday night in the Garden of Gethsemane, and it went all through Thursday night and all day Friday and all day uh, uh, Saturday, and then uh, on a partial day on Sunday. So, you got thir uh, no, excuse me, we got Thursday, Friday, and Saturday days, and we have uh, Thursday night, Friday night, 
and Saturday night is three days and three nights. But we have to include everything that was connected with that. But thank you for calling, and we're going to let's go to our next caller. Please welcome to Open Forum. Yes, uh, I saw the vision, Jesus Christ at the right hand of the glory of God. You cut me off a little bit ago. Oh, excuse me, would you turn your radio off? That will help. I never got to ask my question. Go ahead. What is your question? But do you believe people see visions today? No, that's well. Yes, they can see visions, but they didn't come from God. Yes, they uh, did. Sa uh, it is uh, uh, it is Satan who is able to break the silence between the supernatural and the natural. We've got to pause for this message. Each weekday at this time, we bring you Open Forum, a telephone talk program airing questions on biblical issues. This feature of Family Stations Incorporated will continue in just a moment. You are listening to the Sound of the New Life over Family Radio's Internet broadcast from www.familyradio.com. Family Radio desires to blanket the whole world with the gospel, and that includes India and Sri Lanka. We are developing programs in three important languages of those nations, Oriya, Assamese, and Sinhalese. Our prayer is that God would richly bless the people of India and Sri Lanka. If you speak Oriya, Assamese, or Sinhalese, please call us at one 800 543 one four nine five to find out how you can help to bring the precious message of salvation to your people. That's toll free one eight hundred five four three one four nine five. We continue with more of the open forum. You are invited to call in and ask questions or discuss issues that are related to the Bible. Our number is 1-800-322-5385. That's 1-800-322-5385. When your call goes on the air, please be ready to turn your volume down. Here is our host and Bible teacher, Harold Camping. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, I'd like to say, uh, go ahead with your chap call. Uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 16. Mark 16, verse 16. Okay, there we read. Mark 16, verse 16. We read, He that blesseth, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Yet. Now, what is your question? Heard you teach, and you, concerning baptism, it's like you trample it under your feet, like it doesn't matter. Where Jesus even said you have to be born again of water and spirit. Well, excuse me. Why do you think God spoke, Jesus spoke of, of the fact that, uh, that, there is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What do you think that is? That's the baptism of the Spirit. Okay, that is the, the Holy Spirit is God. Baptism means to wash or to be cleansed. Now, water is water baptism is a sign that is pointing to the spiritual baptism. It has no spiritual substance in itself. It is simply showing us that even as water cleanses dirt from the skin, so we have to be washed by the Holy Spirit, by the Word of God, as He applies the Word of God to our lives and washes away our sins. That is the requirement in order to be, be one of the, those who are saved. Now, secondly, believing, we have to be very careful. Is there work? The Bible tells us that faith is work, and believing is the, is the verb, whereas faith is the noun that has to do with the work of 
believing and Christ did all the work he, he did, it was his work uh, his faithfulness that caused our salvation not ours and so believing is not a cause at, at all for our salvation it, it can't be because it's a work that we do but it is a result of the fact of our or we become saved if we do not have not come to a point where we are we hung our whole life on the Lord Jesus and and are trusting in 100% in the fact that he has done everything to save us we are not saved we think we are but we're really not the commission that Jesus gave the apostles was to teach the gospel well the great commission is to uh, how, how does that go he says that uh, go ye into all the world and bring the gospel by uh, baptizing them into the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, now, that baptizing is not water baptism. That doesn't get anybody saved. That's a sign. That's simply a, a, a teaching help uh, that, you're, that uh, as you are being immersed, you people, uh, you're, you're getting nice and clean on the outside. But now you have to have your sins washed away by Christ, and that can only happen. Baptism. It, uh, it, that can only happen when God saves you, and and you can't do anything to get yourself saved. You have to wait upon Him. You cry out to Him for mercy. Baptism, though, that's a sign of Christ's death and resurrection. As you come out of the water, that's a sign of to other, to other people. You can talk all you want about water baptism, but water baptism is a work that we do. And the Bible warns that we are not to do, uh, try to do anything to get ourselves saved. Uh, the work is all done by Christ. In fact, we now have learned that he had already uh, 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 paid for the sins of all those he came to save before he ever created the world. And now it's just a matter of God... Uh, applying the word of God to those that he that he had already made payment for their sins and uh, so that they would have etern eternal life in their soul existence and, and receive the promise of eternal life in their bodies which they will receive at the time of the rapture this is the way it now now we can know how it all goes together oh, but Peter. this idea of water baptism and that is what all a uh, great many churches teach that there's some substance in water baptism is absolutely wrong it's a man made idea it's a work that we do we when we get baptized in water we are doing the work of of going down into the water or having water poured on us or whatever and there's nothing nothing that we should ever look at that man can do that has made it possible for us to be saved. That, 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 if we do that, we're going to end up for certain, absolutely certainly, under the wrath of God. Even, even the Apostle Peter said that baptism helps you ease your conscience. It's an act towards growing. It's like the milk of the Word. You know, you, you you see, we have to read everything in the Bible. When I read to you, like we read in Galatians chapter two, where God says, in in verse sixteen, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, and water baptism is a work that we do, just like believing is a work that we do. We are is not justified by the works of the law. To be justified means to become saved, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. The, all the work that Jesus did, he did all the work to get us saved. Uh, uh, and then it goes on, Christ even, or we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might, might be justified. Now, we can we begin by believing on him but that doesn't guarantee we're going to get saved we might be justified by the faith of Christ we wait upon him that believing that as we're waiting upon him has nothing to do with us getting saved it is simply a posture that we have 
as because we don't know whether God is going to save us. It certainly is not going to save us because we're believing on him. That's impossible because it says here, not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. We have to read this very carefully. And if you want to get proofs that that indeed that indeed uh, uh, the uh, or faith is a work, we look, for example, at First Thessalonians chapter one, verse three, remembering without ceasing your work of faith. And faith is a noun for the word that as a verb it's believing and so that's work and so let's keep believing entirely away from the basis for our salvation because we uh, we are not saved by any work and if we trust in any work that we have done the Bible clearly tells us we are not saved absolutely not saved but shall we take our next call please welcome to Open Forum Good evening, Mr. Camping. I've been listening to your show for quite some time, and it seems to me that uh, you think that all the people in the churches think that uh, that by going through the baptism that they believe that's how they get saved, and it's not just because they're using it as a sign or like the gentleman that just called as something that eases their mind. It's just a gesture, and they, uh, you know, they, they maybe these people already know that they're not being saved by doing that act, but you seem to think that they think that by doing that act, they're becoming saved. You know what I mean? What, what verse are you looking at? I, I'm just listening to you talk about baptism, and what, what I understand you to be saying is that you believe that everybody in the churches is uh, thinking that by going and getting yourself baptized is also becoming saved. When I, I believe that they're just doing it as uh, a gesture, like the gentleman that just called. He said that uh, in Peter, somewhere in Peter, that uh, it was just an act, a yeah, I'm soothing sorry. act. Ex excuse me, I'm really sorry. I'm having a difficult time following you. Uh, could you try once more, try to express your question just in a very short sentence and, uh, uh, and see if I can follow that. Uh, say it very carefully and slowly. What is your question? Baptism is a faith, or an act of uh, a work. Baptism. And I don't, I don't think there's any problem with uh, work as long as you don't believe that your work is getting your, yourself saved. So there shouldn't be a problem with any work, including what, what? Uh, water baptism, yeah. as long as you understand that it isn't getting you saved. It, you are correct, of course, that water baptism is a work that we do, and, uh, and therefore it cannot be a... Uh, a necessary thing for our salvation because there's no work that we should do uh, to try uh, to get saved. All the work was done long before creation. Christ m made the full payment for our sins and now all he has to do is, is uh, apply that to our hearts and he does that in, in his own time. No man can come to me except the Father draw him and that's 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 the work that Christ does and and besides this we have to remember we have to give all the glory to Christ for our salvation we should not take any and when we are, are saying well you know I was baptized in water and and I did this and I did that and God saved me what we're really doing is yeah, Christ was glorified by saving me, but so was I glorified because I was uh, w working at this, and it's uh, it's it's altogether wrong. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum, Brother Camping. Yes, I have a booklet in front of me that you wrote in 1979 called "When Is the Rapture." Yes. 
is very interesting. Here you are using 1 Thessalonians 4.17 and John 5.28-29 and clearly saying that the rapture, the resurrection of the believers, and the resurrection of the unbelievers, and Judgment Day well, all yeah. occur at the end of time. Yes, yes. Could you explain this to me? Well, yes. You see, uh, uh, in our day, during the last 25 years or 30 years, God has been opening our eyes to more and more truth. Now, when he does that, it means that we find that there are many things we have learned before that the churches have taught and and I have been a church person all my life right in the heartbeat of churches and and I t taught what I had been taught by the churches and uh, and uh, the, what you find there in uh, when is the rapture that book was written uh, a long long ago before I had uh, before God was opening my eyes to a lot of new truth now as we have been going along right up until just a few months ago, God has been opening my eyes to more and more. And every time we have new truth, it means that we have to admit what we have taught sometime in the past was incorrect. It was, it was, it was, we didn't understand it properly. And we, and we have to have the humility to really be ready to say that it was incorrect. It, it was wrong what I was teaching because God had not opened my spiritual eyes to this truth the way it really, now that I, that I understand it correctly. And so that's why, for example, we don't give out the little booklet, When is the Rapture, anymore, because it has, while it is uh, somewhat in some aspects accurate in that the, the rapture would be at the end and there's no, there, there's no, uh, a thousand years afterwards or anything like that uh, or great tribulation after it was accurate in, in that part but it was it, we it, I at that time the in the churches they did not have and neither did I have any understanding of the details of God's judgment plan as we know it today you you were using the feast of the tabernacles at the end of the world the end of the year as the end of time, the harvest for the crops, as the harvest for the mankind, and the end of Israel's sojourn for Israel, as the end of wilderness sojourn for believers. In the last day, Exodus in Exodus 23:16, and the last day, John 12:48, and John 6:39 and 40, with without a doubt that you said this is this is the way it is and thus saith the Lord. Now, who's to say that you won't change this again in six months if more revelation well, comes because, to you? Well, because the, the God doesn't it doesn't have another little book. There was a little book that God that we re read about in the book of Daniel, Daniel 12. That book, God told Daniel, seal it seal it. It's for the time of the end. Then we read in Revelation 5 and 6 about the opening of that little book. Uh, Christ is opening it and as we read it, we find that he's telling us about all these things that we presently are learning. Now, the Bible doesn't indicate now there's another little book that has to be opened. That's the, that's the end. That, there's no nothing more to be opened up. So what we're learning now is what God has kept sealed uh, 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 30 years ago. That book was not open to us, except it was just, we're just beginning to get a little glamour, a glimmer of it as we were able to, to uh, know, uh, for example, the date of creation. That was the beginning of it. And slowly on, we've been learning other things. But... Uh, uh, the, the God gives, gives no indication in the Bible that there will be a second opening. There's a one opening that there at near the end of time God will open this little book. It's, it's sealed with seven seals. It's written on all through the book and on, on the covers. 
but it's been sealed. And when that book is opened, then we've come to the end, and that's where we are. That's why we have all this understanding. So w w there's no nothing in the Bible that tells us. But now be careful. Now there there might be another little book that is going to be open, or there may be more that is going to tumble out later on, and we're going to have to say we're uh, inaccurate. That is not found in the Bible. But uh, but uh, uh, we we uh, that's why. What we've learned just in the last 10 years has been phenomenal. It's just been so much. It's because God had sealed it, and now God has been opening it up. And and as we check it out in the Bible, we find, yes, that's accurate. That that fits. That's the way it is. And And all kinds of verses that before were troublesome, we didn't know what to do with them, now we do understand them. They all begin to fit into place. Uh, in other words, we begin to get more and more harmony in our teaching of everything in the Bible, even the teaching of salvation. We've learned way more in these days about what salvation really is than we'd ever known before. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I have two questions. You kind of cut me short earlier, and it's talking about, like, when God coming and stuff like that. Tell me if I'm wrong. Aren't we supposed to be waiting for him today and, like, every day wake up and wait for him? We are supposed to be waiting for him because that's why I still don't see no need of telling people that God is coming and they put their life on hold or whatever they're doing on hold. And it's like you're giving them one more chance to sin before God coming if they know the date and the time. And they know everything. It don't make any sense to me. And my second question is that if we don't have to do anything for our salvation or anything, so after we get saved, what do we do? Sit home and wait for God to come? We don't have to go out and preach the word to nobody. If all we have to do is just sit home and wait till God comes. Excuse me. Now, I never have said that at all. The Bible tells us, ye are my witnesses. You are my ambassadors. Christ, as it were, making his appeal through you. Uh, God assigns us the task of sharing the word. We have to wait upon him to become saved. We cannot get ourselves saved. We have to wait upon him. We don't like that, but that's what the Bible teaches we ha he has to do all the work of saving us and and uh, when we begin to find an intense love for the lord an intense love for the word of god we begin to sense like the bible talks about in math in romans 8 verse 15 that god's spirit is witnessing with our spirit that we are children of god then also there will be an intense desire to uh, share the word of God because God commands us to go into all the world with the gospel and it, it all hangs together it all fits together uh, but we can only really understand that when we really have become a child of God but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum how you doing very well thank you go ahead I just have a little question to ask you. You seem to be bashing baptism very bad, but it's in every single Bible. Can you explain that to me? Uh, explain. I said, repeat that again. Uh, what about baptism? You're saying baptism's bad pretty much. I don't get that. It's in every single Bible that you read. Well, the Bible, for example, just to give you an illustration, in, in Acts chapter 2, we find it talks about baptism. And, uh, there, and I'm going to give you two illustrations. Yeah. In Acts 2, we read there, uh, in verse 38, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, uh, uh, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, do you read? Uh, do you read there that uh, we're to be baptized with water? That we are to be baptized with water? 
Uh, the answer is, no, we don't see the word water at all. It says we have to be baptized. So that means that baptism is really very good. But what kind of baptism? We have to search the Bible. And we find that the baptism that's Im the important baptism is baptism with the Holy Spirit. That is, God has to wipe away our sins. Likewise, when we come to the last chapter of Matthew, in, in Matthew 28, we read in verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Does it talking about uh, about water baptism here? No, not a bit. It, so will water baptism bring them in into a personal relationship with Christ, as, which is what salvation is? We know, of course not. Of course not. That we have to be baptized with the whole, with the Holy Spirit. Now, how do we do that? Well, we have to sh share the gospel and encourage people to pray for salvation, to wait upon the Lord for salvation. Uh, but this, this, then we know when they become saved, because God has done all the work. Then we know that they have been baptized into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That washing, of course, is 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 an integral part of what salvation is. It, you you aren't saved unless your sins have been all washed away. But okay, thank, I got another question. Then, how do we get rid of original sin, and why was Jesus baptized in the Jordan River? Well, now when Jesus was baptized, that was part of Old Testament yeah. rituals, a, a ceremonial law. He was not baptized like we are believers baptized. He he came as the high priest. And before a high priest could go about his work as high priest, uh, he had to be ceremonially washed or ceremonially baptized. Now, this was done in the temple. There were two big, there was a big laver of water there, big basin of water, and he washed his hands and his feet to show that he was completely spiritually cleansed by, uh, 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 as, uh, or, or at least ceremonially cleansed so he could go about his work as, uh, as high priest. Now, Jesus could not, he was ready to go about his work as, as high priest because he came as the high priest uh, to, uh, in connection with salvation, but he could not go into the temple to be washed, have his hands and his feet washed there because he was not of the tribe of Levi. The high priest came from the tribe of Levi. Christ was from the tribe of, of uh, Ju Judah. And so, uh, and so he could not, he was not, he could not come there. So God dispatched John the Baptist, who incidentally was a direct descendant, uh, uh, both through his mother and his father from Aaron, who was the first high priest. But he sent him to uh, apply the ceremonial water so that Jesus would be ceremonially cleansed and able to go about his work as high priest. And that was done in the Jordan River. And that's, some, that's an act that had, was completely a separate kind of an act from a water baptism that, uh, that God commands us, except that the water baptism is also a ceremonial act. Now, in Jesus' case, for example, he had no sin to be washed away. It was simply a ceremonial act that, that, that the, the high priest, in order to uh, be an adequate high priest, uh, should also have had his sins washed away. But thank you for calling wait, in. Wait, yeah. wait, no, no. Yeah. Wait, Jesus, though, let me ask you had original sin, then how do you get rid of that? Explain that. That he did which? Sin. We're all born with it, aren't we? It's in the Bible. That Jesus. Uh, uh, did not have any original sin because he was the son of God. He did not have original sin. He uh, 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 he became sin for us. That is, but he, when he came to demonstrate 
he, to demonstrate how he suffered for our sin, he was not laden with any sin at all. He simply came to show us how he suffered for our sins. But now we've come to the end of our time. The Lord willing, we will be back together again uh, next Monday evening. Uh, uh, until then, let's keep reading the Bible, keep trusting the Bible. Uh, 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 and so at this time, I'm going to say good night.